Thank you very much. Um, I want to start with a question. And the question is, what are these two slides? Which of these two slides uh, has a brown heritage tourism sign? The first is of, of a McDonald's in Carmarthen. The second is Sudley Castle, which used to be the home of Richard III, is where Catherine Parr is buried um, and was the royalist stronghold in the Civil War. The answer, of course, is the McDonald's. <laughs> the, reason, the reason is that government guidelines now for the eligibility of brown signs is not on whether it is a genuine heritage attraction, but on the number of days it is open a year, the number of car parking spaces, and the number of toilets. Oh yes, the great British toilet. I say of course, because under the previous two governments, heritage and tourism has been shamefully pushed out to the political fringes of debate and policy. Yet tourism is our fifth largest industry, bigger than the automotive and pharmaceutical industries. Since 2010, tourism has been the fastest growing sector in the UK. But the British government has no minister for heritage. This is because heritage was a dirty word in Tony Blair's Cool Britannia. He abolished the Department of National Heritage in 1997 and replaced it with the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. It was David Cameron who finally killed off the Department of Heritage and Tourism in his reshuffle of 2012 and put tourism under sports and equalities. Tourism has been disgracefully marginalized and heritage and tourism no longer has a voice or a seat at the top table of government. What, I ask, has equality has got to do with an economic sector that it is about our historic castles, Stonehenge, our great countryside, and regenerated seaside resorts like Brighton, Bournemouth, and Margate? Nothing is the answer. A main reason that domestic tourism has been so sidelined is the government prefers to spend our money spinning Britain's image abroad. It is good political PR for Cameron. If you happen to be in Germany recently, you will have opened your Die Zeit and found a glossy 12-page supplement inside entitled Natur ist Grit. The campaign is part of a new 3.5 million push to encourage Germans to visit Britain. Researchers found that of all the European countries, Germans are the most keen on exploring outside of London. And walking alongside Broadstairs Beach this morning, thinking what I was going to say, I noticed that the beach is known to locals as Viking Bay. It's good to see that this German appetite for our shores has been going strong since 90, 947 AD. I thought you might like to see a map of Britain as through German tourist eyes. This is in Dizit. Uh, spent for by British taxpayers. No, there's no Viking Bay, doesn't feature, but there is Betty's of Harrogate. Oh yes, the great British tea room. The Britain is great campaign is a commendable success, but why are we spending millions in German newspapers promoting British tea rooms while spending almost nothing promoting tourism in our own country? Visit England, which is the arm responsible for our domestic tourism, has had its budget slashed by Direct, indirectly by 100 million development agencies were abolished and have been replaced by things called destination management centers, which is why I've launched my tourism on tour campaign and will be touring the countryside and seaside resorts in my new campaign car, a V8 Jaguar Sovereign in dark purple, otherwise known... <laughs> otherwise known as the Purple Godiva. Built as a British touring saloon car to rival European touring cars, the JAG stands for more touring around the country, the English rather than the continental road trip. After a lengthy search for the vehicle, I tracked one down, one of these rare purple ones, in Blackpool. A proper British touring car made in Coventry. 
Too much UK tourism is geared around London and Oxford and Cambridge and a few big stately homes, which have become like the old great seaside of Victorian resorts of the 19th century. Take Downton. Plenty of money has been spent in America paying for full-page ads that depict Lord Grantham standing outside, outside Highclere Castle, which it says is just 90 minutes from London. That is if you take the M3, not the M4, Nigel. <laughs> the problem is that the coalition is being hypocritical. One reason the, British is great, the Britain is Great campaign is not marketed across Britain is that much of what the campaign stands for, the heritage, the countryside, and the tourism that makes up the best of Britain has been betrayed and undermined by the Tory-led coalition. And it is precisely because of this betrayal of the best of Britain that I joined UKIP and accepted Nigel's invitation to become party heritage spokesman for a cause I believe in passionately. My cause is about saving England from rural vandalism and the preservation and protection of Britain's great heritage, architecture, and our green countryside on which our tourism industry depends. David Cameron may think the economy is their vote-winning card, but they miss the point of people while I, such as I choose to live in the great countryside, in the part of Shropshire that P.G. Woodhouse called the paradise of England. I love living in the English countryside, not for economic or material reasons, but for our unique quality of life, which is why 12 million countryside voters across England are sick of being at war with their own communities. The Tory-led coalition's claims for localism are a fiction. The reason I took up the invitation from Nigel to be our heritage spokesman is that I come from a family in which I was taught that you believe if a cause is enough, you embrace it passionately and fight from the iron part of your soul. And you cannot remain playing wine bar politics. You have to stand up and do something about it. To give an example of the great betrayal, the last season of Downton Abbey opened with a scene filmed inside a famous grade one listed barn known as Great Coxwell Barn in Oxfordshire. Happens to be close to where David Cameron was brought up in the countryside. It looks like a quintessential village of England. When you drive into Great Coxwell, you see why the barn is grade one listed. It was described by William Morris as the finest architecture in England, unapproachable in its dignity. Unapproachable, that is, until the NPPF came along, which has resulted in a rural revolt from 12 million rural voters who feel betrayed. The truth is that within two weeks of the NPPF guidelines being published, a government inspector had given permission for a housing development to be built within 500 yards of the Great Barn. Under the old planning system, the great Coxwell development had been rejected, with the inspector writing, I fully appreciate the obvious pressures for new housing in attractive villages, but there is equally a long-standing commitment to the protection of our heritage of historic buildings. Under this government, new housing and the gold rush for renewable energy has been prioritized over tourism and heritage. If new housing can be built within sight of one of the finest grade one medieval structures in the country, what hope is there for other listed buildings that make up our rich heritage? None, of course. Which is why a government inspector has allowed a wind turbine on the battlefield of Naseby, where British democracy was born, and why a planning inspector overruled all 100 residents of Winnick in North Ants, where Sir Thomas Mallory lived in the manor, except, of course, the substitute junking farmer, who voted 100% of the village, all 100, voted to oppose the Eon Germany energy wind farm, and yet it was approved by a planning inspector. These unwanted towering industrial structures not only make a mockery of so-called localism, they are symbols of aesthetic, social, and EU oppression. Some, something needs to be done about the desecration of our English countryside, as Andrew has quite so rightly pointed out. This is why I'm so proud to be standing here. Our party stands for sticking up for the best of Britain. We are the only party that is working to protect our heritage and our historic buildings. 
HS2 will rip through Shakespeare's Forest of Arden in North Warwickshire, where I am standing as a PPC on May the 7th. That HS2 is ripping through shake the heart of Shakespeare's England, putting a stake through the heart of old England, tells you everything you need to know about Labour and Tories' big business priorities in the rural countryside. What makes Britain great is our green countryside and historic market towns like Atherston, which used to be the hat-making capital of England. Their identity is now under threat from mass housing that will include three times the amount of homes that will irrevocably change the identity of these places. We are the only party that is speaking up for rural communities. And this is also the view of Simon Jenkins, former chairman of the National Trust, who says only UKIP is standing up to developers to fight for what makes Britain the envy of the world, our beautiful villages, towns, countryside and landscape. Enough is enough. UKIP will end this discrimination against our historic legacy by creating a new Minister of State for Heritage and Tourism. We will create ministers for both tourism and heritage to preserve our history for future generations. The Tory-led government have marginalised tourism with a tax regime that punishes those who cherish repairing and sharing their old buildings, whilst rewarding developers who want to ruin the historic identity of our scenic villages and market towns. UKIP will roll back Osborne's VAT, uh, policies and cut the 20% VAT levy on listed building repairs and maintenance to just 5% to incentivise the upkeep of Britain's nearly 500,000 listed buildings that are the backbone of our tourism industry. UKIP's policies will also boost skilled British workers and craftsmen, such as stonemasons, thatchers and carpenters, whose traditional skills are the lifeblood of local communities. We will introduce new... We will introduce new rural conservation areas to protect scenic countryside and market town settings, as well as the cathedral cities whose character is so essential for regional growth. We will return the presumption in favour of conservation as opposed to the current presumption in favour of development and destruction. I began, I began by highlighting the nonsense that fast food restaurants can get brown tourist signs when historic castles cannot. UKIP will ensure only proper tourist signs get the iconic brown sign to make them more relevant to genuine tourism as well as our 25,000 bed and breakfasts. We are not purely about commercial concerns. There will be signs, these will all be signs to the best of Britain. Now, another important part of the tourism business. Saving the great British pub. Welcome to the Purple Godiva. The UK has lost 21,000 pubs since 1980. Half of these closures have taken place since 2006. Taxation, regulation and the recent decline in disposable incomes are leading causes of the decimation of the UK pub industry. The smoking ban and the alcohol duty escalator are particularly culpable and responsible for some 6,000 pub closures. A better approach under UKIP will be to reduce alcohol duty, relax the smoking ban, reduce VAT to 15% and lower it further for food sales and scrap the late night levy. Next, the seaside economy, how UKIP will regenerate our declining coastal resorts. Politics at the seaside used to be a great British tradition, like seaside holidays. But don't be fooled into thinking that Margate is a retro choice for UKIP holding its last conference before the most important election in a generation. Coastal populations have been all but ignored by the main parties, but parties ignore coastal communities at their peril. As seen by our by-election victory in Clacton-on-Sea, a town mocked by Paris, Mark Matthew Paris, as a resort trying to die. The disaffected coastal vote can have a political sting sharper than any jellyfish.
Whilst the metropolitan elite regard coastal towns as symbols of failure and the past, UKIP isn't afraid to tackle the socio-economic issues head on. Blackpool, ranked as one of the most deprived local authority areas in the UK, holds up a broken mirror to the worst problems. When I went to Blackpool to collect my purple jag sovereign the other day, the owner said he was selling it because it wasn't safe to leave it parked in central Blackpool anymore. Blackpool gets 8,000 new residents a year, of which 85% claim housing benefit. This transient it puts ever more pressure on local hospitals, police, and schools, where turnover rates in primary schools is as high as 30 and 40 percent. And not only that, it deters new investment and deters families from moving there, hence the perpetual decline. 83 percent of new housing benefit claims are from new people moving from outside the area. That the Tories have not held a political conference in Blackpool since 2007 is symptomatic of how terminally unloved Britain's once grand seaside towns have become. But UKIP, we love the coastal town. Somebody else did as well. You might not like her, but at least back on October the 11th, 1985, Margaret Thatcher stood up in the winter gardens of Blackpool and recalled her first Blackpool conference in 1974 as leader and said, we all love Blackpool. Recalling the Labour Britain of 1979, she said Britain had become the sick man of Europe. The fault lay in governments who dodged difficult problems rather than facing up to them. Such a diagnosis fits exactly the situation with government and, co and, and coastal towns today. Have they given up on towns like Blackpool because they think there is no solution? or because they don't want to address what a mess it is made of welfare and housing benefit. The truth is landlords have no incentive to upgrade their properties because the government's twisted property and welfare system gives landlords in Blackpool a higher rental yield than in Belgravia. Blackpool's director of housing told me that a, a six-bed sit typical guest house on Charnley Road in very poor condition should be worth 90,000. But in Blackpool, because the market is driven by housing benefit, it is worth 250,000, thanks to an annual rental income of 36,360, most of it which is not declared. There is no incentive to reverse the terminal depression. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> finally, I just want to say that uh, the seaside towns like Brighton, Margate and Broadstairs that have best weathered the economic storms of recent years are those that have reinvented themselves by embracing their past and their history. To win the seaside vote and the rural vote, I say we need to weaponize our heritage. <laughs>